Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Santinetti, and we're looking at Joshua chapter 3, and it's just an amazing adventure when you see what God did to prepare Joshua and the people to cross over the Jordan for the victory. And you know something, that when we look at this chapter, what a preparation, how God did this. And we spoke yesterday about the month of Nisan, and the 10th day is when they crossed over the Jordan. It would be the exact day, sack month, sack day, that they came out of Egypt. And Moses dies a month. This is in Deuteronomy. When he died, he died a month before the month of Nisan on the seventh day. And they mourned for him 30 days. So it was the seventh of Nisan. Joshua sends two spies. They go in. They come back. And then he says, that he says that Joshua got up early in the morning and, he, and they removed themselves from Shittim, which is a place of acacia wood, a place that was uh, used also as far as the wood to build the tabernacle. That's later on. And um, we see that he brought them to the Jordan and Israel did not pass over. He had them stand at the edge. So after this, that they went through, the, as he commanded the people to go to the edge of the Jordan, the Bible tells us that God gave instruction to, the, for, to Joshua to tell the priests what to do. And uh, they commanded the people saying, when you see the, the covenant of the Lord, your God, and the priests and the Levites bearing it, that you shall remove from your place and go after it. I want you to keep that word or that phrase in mind. When you see the ark, go after it. And uh, yet, he says, there shall be a span between you and the Ark of the Covenant, about 2,000 cubics, that's 3,000 feet. And we know that two always represents in the Bible the number of witness, but three represents the number of God, because he is the, the one that completes us. He is complete in everything. He doesn't need anything, but God is holy, and we are his children. Now, Make sure that you keep a distance, very important. And we know that God is actually distant from us because he's in heaven, we can't see him. But yet, we see the things that he does in our lives and we see the presence of Jesus in our lives because the Holy Spirit is in us and we live by the power of the Holy Spirit and we must go after him. And when you do this, stay away for a little bit. In other words, this way you can see where you're going. That's, that was the whole purpose of having that space. And folks, let me tell you something. We have to be careful that we don't go before God. I'm not talking about before His presence, but there are things that we do in life that we go before Him, and when we get there, we realize that the Ark of the Covenant is not there. In other words, the seal of God's presence is not there in what we do. And that's why it's important for us to stay right here in this Word. Because here, as we read the Word of God, the will of God will be revealed to you. It will be revealed to us. And that's why sometimes we, when we miss it, we say, God, what happened? He says, you went before me. You should have let me gone before you. And that's the whole process. And anything that you do in life, whether it be business, family, relationships, whatever it is, make sure the Lord is before you and he is leading you. As a matter of fact, Moses told the, the Lord, he said, Lord, if you don't go before us, I'm not moving. He said, if I have found favor in your sight, let me see your glory. He wanted to make sure that God went before him. And the Bible tells us that the Lord told them that he would go before him. Now Joshua told the people, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. And we spoke about those wonders. But remember that there are different types of wonders that God does. And according to your sanctification, I'm going to say that. According to how much you have set yourself aside, God will use you in extraordinary ways. Now, someone said that we are extraordinary people. I wouldn't agree with that so much. No, supernatural people. We're not supernatural people. We're regular people. I'm a man. <laughs> We're human. And so we have to allow God to be supernatural through us because it is him. But we're just vessels, right? You took the vessel and you spoke to the vessel and you said, how beautiful is this vessel? And the vessel doesn't speak back because it's a vessel. You put things in and you pour things out. And that's all we are. We're just vessels. But when it's sanctified, God fills it 
with whatever he wants and he uses us in different ways. And so he says, sanctify yourself. And he spoke to them. He said, take up the Ark of the Covenant, pass over the people. This is the priests and the Levites. And they took the Ark and went before the people. In other words, they, they marched on. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to magnify you in the sight of Israel, that you may know, as I was with Moses, I am with you. The reason that God did this, because look, watch, watch this now. Sometimes we can get elevated and we become proud, but God made sure he told them, I'm going to elevate you, but for only for one reason is to verify the ministry of Moses that was passed on to you by the laying on of hands. Uh -huh. So you're not greater than Moses. I am confirming what I am doing in you just as I did in Moses. Now, folks, let me tell you something. Jesus allowed himself to be baptized by John the Baptist. And a lot of people say, why did he allow that? Because Jesus said, this must be done to fulfill all righteousness. He says, but he wasn't repenting of sins. He was not confessing of sins. No. What Jesus did, because John was the forerunner before him. He's the one that went proclaiming the message that the Messiah was coming, that he was the one chosen to make the path straight for him. Now watch this now. He allowed John the Baptist to baptize him for, for what? All righteousness to be fulfilled? Yes. To, excuse me, to confirm that the ministry of John the Baptist was sent by God. Uh -huh. Jesus entered into that ministry, allowed himself to be associated with that ministry so that people will know that the ministry of John is John's ministry from God, from heaven. That's why when they asked him, you know, who gave you authority to do these things later in the temple, he says, I'll ask you a question and you tell me. And if you answer me, I will tell you what authority. He said, was John the Baptist sent from God or from man? <laughs> and like the Jewish do, they, they pull to the side, they begin to, to uh, speak about it. And they said, we don't know. That's what they told Jesus. We don't know. He says, well, since you can't tell me, I'm not going to tell you. You know what their conversation was? If we say that he was from heaven, he's going to tell us, how come you didn't listen to him? If he says that he came from the people, in other words, that he's, this ministry is from the people, is that they're going to stone us because everybody knew that John the Baptist was sent by God. And so understand that here, Joshua was magnified by the Lord. The Lord says, I'm going to open you up. I'm going to lift you up so that people can see that I have entered into your ministry, into your purpose and what you're doing, so that when you go into battle, they will follow you. Folks, don't follow anyone that the Lord has not magnified in their ministry. Be very careful of your leadership or the people you know leaders over your life. Make sure that they're walking right. Make sure that they're not lovers of money, lovers of the flesh, and lovers of this world. The leaders, those who are leading the, the, the congregation of Christ, have to be walking right with God. Otherwise, it will affect the entire congregation. Mm -hmm. Amen. Verse 8, And you shall command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, and when you... And when you come to the brink of the water of Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. In other words, when you come to that place, don't move. Why? Because God was going to do something and he needed them to be obedient. And we spoke about the brink. The brink is a place where the rivers flow. But when you look at the word brink, and I just want to go there real quick. Excuse me. <clears throat> when you look at the word brink, you see it's a place of trials and tribulation is a place where you are verged. And verge, watch this, verge means this, at the threshold, at the threshold of the borders of something that is limit, or, watch this now, the threshold of danger. Now, I do music, and I mix. And we have what is called compressors, and compressors have what is called a threshold. And so, when something is too loud, you put the compressors on it, and you set the threshold so that if they scream too loud, it doesn't go above a mark so that it doesn't come out in the speakers at you. And so a threshold is a place that actually conceals you and compresses you. And so here the Lord was telling Joshua that when they get to the bank of the river, not to move. Why? Because I'm going to compress them. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and sometimes you say, Lord, the pressure is too much. I can't take it. He says, you can take it. I'm compressing you. Why? So that you do not move ab above the limit, above the word that I have spoken to you. Because what I'm about to do, I'm going to do it before your eyes. And he told, watch this now. He tells him this. Joshua says this. He tells the children, come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, hereby you will know that the living God is among you and that he will not fail to drive out your enemies. There were seven enemies which we're going to get into, but not today. And we know them. They're the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. Now watch this. Seven enemies, potential enemies, and we're going to get later into this because they all have a significance and a purpose. And God says, I'm going to destroy them before you. So behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of the earth passes before you. And now he says, now take, take 12 men, one out of each tribe of Israel, and it will come to pass when the soles of the feet of the high of the priests and the Levites even touch the water, the water will begin to part. In other words, as they stepped into the water, it parted. And as they stepped into the water further, it parted. And it kept parting. But the Lord did a miracle because he told them, take 12 men. I can imagine as they're taking it, it's just parting. And then he just parted the whole Jordan River. And he said, take 12 men, one from every tribe, and tell them that when they get in the middle, the people are to pass over. Can you imagine that? They're standing in the middle. The water is, is, is up high. It was standing in a heap because he said that the water shall stand. It will be cut off from the rivers coming down. It will be cut off and they will stand like a heap, just like he did in the Red Sea. What is the, def what is the difference between the Red Sea and the Jordan? Well, when they came out of Egypt, remember, they're still God's people. People say, well, they got saved. Well, they were pointed to, actually the Red Sea was pointed to a New Testament, to the New Testament salvation of Christ. But think about this. Were they not God's people in Egypt? They were God's people from Abraham. Now watch this now. It was to show them something, that they were going to be baptized into Moses because Moses would represent Christ and the law. And coming out of Egypt, they needed a law to guide them and to show them. But they were baptized into Moses, and we can say that this is their, their salvation. Okay, great. So then what is the process of the Jordan opening up so that they can go through? It was the process to cleanse them from the 40 years that they were in the desert. Do you know that they were in the desert and they, they traveled 42 locations? And when I started thinking about this, I said, this is very interesting because I understand, you know, the, the numbers of the Bible, uh, still learning some things, but I understand. And I said, how interesting it is that from Abraham to David, is 42, there's a, a 14 generations. And from David to the exile, there's 14 generations. And from the exile to Jesus, there's 14 generations. That's 42. And it's interesting how from Abraham all the way to Jesus, the suffering of Israel has always been traveling, has always been going through different stages of life because God was bringing them to the Messiah. And it's interesting that he did not take them out of the desert until they passed through those 42 locations, wherever they were. And we have them, but I don't have time to break all of them down to you. So 42 generations up to Jesus. And we think about now the church. And I said, you know, this message is not going to be very popular, with, especially with Christians, because, you know, we're, we're the head, not the, not the tail, fine, and, and we're the blessed, and that's fine, and, and this world is ours. I said, excuse me, this world is not ours. It belongs to the Lord, number one. And the system is corrupt, as we know, because if it wasn't corrupt, we wouldn't have all this stuff happening. If people just turn to the Lord, we will see a, a revival such as has never been seen. But instead, Jesus said that the trials and the tribulation that's coming to the world has not been seen even before the overthrow of the world, the foundation of the world. What's coming is so deep and so painful and so deep in, as far as, as tribulation and trials and persecution. We ain't seen nothing yet. And so where's the church? The church is still somewhat wandering in the world. We're still in the desert preaching the gospel, 
that Jesus Christ is coming. And granted, even while they were in the desert, God took care of them. He did not let their shoes wear out. He did not let, they, let their clothes wear out. He kept them until that generation died out. He says, I'm not in the desert. I got a business. I'm doing what? Well, praise God. But this desert place here, this is not my home. I'm a pilgrim passing through. That's all we are. So he brought them to the place of the bank of the, of the, of the Jordan River. And he says that I want you to take 12 men. Watch this now. And when the people pass over, I want them to pick up 12 stones. Mm. And I want, I watch this. I want each stone to represent each tribe of Israel. And I want you to heap them up. Why? So that when they look at them, people say, what's that? He says, this is the place where Israel crossed the Jordan River. This is the place where the memorial has been set. This is the place like when we went to the cross of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And we went there and we repented and we got saved because he saved us by his blood. The cross is the memorial. Watch this. The cross is the memorial. The place where we pass through the Red Sea. Watch this. But then we come to the Jordan, the place where we die and we resurrect with Christ. Because watch this. In the presence of God, we are clean. We are blameless. Are you hearing me? Blameless, without spot and without wrinkle. And the Lord Jesus Christ keeps us that way because we are in Christ. Folks, we are in Christ in Christ, and Christ is over us, and we are in the hand of the Father. What can take you from there? Tell me what power can snatch you out of his hands. There is none, because once that sanctification process has been working in you, God is sending, setting a memorial in you for you to know where you're really standing. And we ought always to give thanks to God for you, my brethren beloved, by the Lord, Paul says, because God has chosen you as the first fruits to be saved, boom, through sanctification by the Spirit and believe in truth. And remember that this Crossing of the river is to be celebrated on the month of Nisan, every 10th, the 10th of Nisan, every year. And let me tell you something. This is where most of the feasts of Israel take place. The Sakat, the, the, the time of the, uh, the tabernacles, the booths of the tabernacles. As a matter of fact, before Jesus went to the cross, did he not go to what is called the mountain of transfiguration? And the Bible says, as he prayed, he was transfigured right before his disciples. They saw the glory of God in the Messiah. And watch this. Also appeared Moses and Elijah speaking with him. Why not? The law and the prophets speak to the Son of God because he's the one that sent them. And boy, Peter got excited. Babe, P P Peter got excited. You know what he said? He said, it is good to be here. Yeah. Huh. And he had James and John. And they're like, yes. And he said, Peter said, oh, excuse me. And I'm paraphrasing. Excuse me. Lord, uh, should we build like, you know, since this is the time of the, the, the time of the booth, shall we build a booth for you and Moses and Elijah? And of course for them. And we'll just stay right here on this mountain. And while he was speaking, a cloud came and, and enveloped them. And they heard a voice, the voice of God. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You listen to him. And the Bible says that the cloud lifted up and they saw no one else but Jesus. Moses was gone. The law of the Old Testament was no longer going to be in effect against people. But watch this, because of the grace that is found in, in Christ. And Elijah was gone, which represents the prophets of Israel. And they were saying, all has been fulfilled in him. He is the law. He is the prophet that Moses prophesied about. Understand that the commandments that God gave Joshua to do this, it was a command so that he, they understand that the commandments of God is our sanctification. If you cannot follow the simple instructions that I give you, how are you going to be properly sanctified? And watch this. For every commandment is like a washing of the water of the word. And every time we obey a commandment, watch this. As we step forward in God, the waters begin to open up. And God takes us through for the victory. For every command that we adhere to and obey 
God's command is a blessing because every command has an attachment of the blessing of God. I'm going to stop here right now, and we're going to pick it up to tomorrow, and we're going to talk about my servant Moses is dead, and Joshua, you're the one to take them into the promised land. And we're going to talk about this now. They crossed the Jordan. They did it. They set up a memorial forever. Christ is our memorial forever. And that memorial stands no matter what. People cannot break up that memorial. It stands firm in the heavens. It stands firm on the earth in the hearts of those that believe. God bless you.